uh, every day online, and uh, that's good news. And appreciate all the good reports we heard from churches uh, that came, and all the everybody got home safe. That's a pretty big undertaking, taking that many people. They like over at that compound with guns going off, four wheelers and side by sides and volleyball, people running in every different direction. And the Lord blessed us again, got everybody home safe. So thank you for praying. All right, let's go to Philippians chapter number two uh, this evening. And we got to that, that verse there, uh, about verse 12. And if, if you'll help me, listen to me tonight. We're going to go on through this tonight, point out some things I believe they have to. So if you'll listen, we're going to talk about some doctrine in just a few minutes. So listen carefully. All right, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, I went into detail about that verse last week. And, of course, that does not mean that we are working for our salvation. We are working out something that's already inside. And that's what it says. Work out your salvation. It's inside you. And as you serve God and do good works, you're working out what God has put in you. Uh, for the next verse, and we went, I'm skipped doing this fast because I went over it last week. For it is God which worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. So, of course, everything we have, everything we know, God puts it in us and gives us the will and the strength to do it. Now, verse 14. Do all things without murmuring and disputing. Oh, my goodness. That verse is saying, whatever we do for God, you know, in plain language, it said do it without griping. Uh, if you gripe about everything you do and fuss like you're the only one doing anything, you're, you're taking the joy out of it, and you're also losing whatever, <laughs> whatever reward you might have got. Hey, if I go in here, well, if I go in here and I come in here and I say, my goodness, I'm this thing of this church. I'm, I'm the only one that does anything around here. Nobody will help me. I tell you, I'm, I have to pray. I have to preach. I have to do everything. Well, the, the Lord ain't going to bless some kind of griping attitude like that. As a matter of fact, if you read that Old Testament, and I, how many of y'all done started all over again this week? Most of us, amen. I did. We all did. Um, if you read that Old Testament, one of the biggest sins they committed in that Old Testament was griping, murmuring. You know, people, God don't look at stuff the way we, we look at it. We look at why well, he robbed a bank. You know, he shot somebody. All that's terrible. Do you know what the Lord did? There's people guilt just for griping after how good he's been to them. So uh, do everything you do without murmurings and disputing, arguing and fussing and fighting. It's never of God for people to fuss and f argue and bicker back and forth. It's not of God. And I've been through so much of that stuff in my life. I told somebody years ago, I said, look, if you want to if you want to come in here and let's talk about Scripture, you want to uh, you want to go back and forth about how we feel about Scripture stuff, I'd, I'd love to do that anytime, but I ain't got time for nobody in here to fuss and argue. When you fuss and argue and start, I ain't got the door. Y'all want to start fussing in here tonight? I'll just go and get my car and leave. I ain't got time for it. It don't accomplish nothing. It don't help nothing. It just comes into a shouting match and, and, and screaming and hollering. God ain't in a million miles of stuff like that. Christians ought to be able to discuss their differences uh, without blowing up, like he's saying, duck, you know, and throwing things, stuff like that. We've all come short of that. I have, but uh, we ought to. Um, now, quickly, verse 15. That you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of God. Went into that last week. The sons of God is a term designated for a creation, an act of creation of God. So when God made the world, he doesn't start it over in Genesis, right? God made the world. He made the first man. He created Adam out of the dust of the earth. Adam, then Eve. Took, took man's real out. And, get, and made Eve out of the woman. Like she's talking about. Like Susan's talking about. She, the woman. Woman. Womb. Womb. Man with a womb. What a woman is. And he took that rib out of Adam's side. And he put it in her. And made them. Then they sinned. And then the Bible said after that. Adam begot a son in his own likeness. And in his image. 
So Adam was made in the image of God, and then they sinned and got cursed come on the world, and then their kids was in their image. So a lot of people say, a lot of people say, look at us and say, we're all in the image of God. Uh, no, no, we're not. Not now. We're flawed. We're flawed by sin. You surely don't think the Lord wanted all of us to look like this, do you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but uh, we get we get old. We die. We have we have deformities. We have stuff wrong with us. Uh, Adam didn't have nothing wrong with him. Perfect man. Then he begat sons in his own image. So the sons of God was a direct creation of God. Then nobody else had the image of God till Jesus Christ showed up in Matthew chapter one, and he was the express image of his person. What the Bible says. Then when the Holy Ghost came down, we're born again. Men, you become sons of God, spiritually. And one day we'll be sons of God literally and physically when we get our new body. That's, that's, the way, that's what he means. Harm. Now look, look that word uh, blameless in verse 15. Because you see that in other places in the Bible. Blameless never means sinless. Blameless never means sinless. Like that qualification of a bishop over there in, in 1 Timothy 3. A bishop must be blameless. Well, I mean, I don't mean sinless. It's like saying Job was perfect. Job wasn't sinless. So Noah was perfect. Noah wasn't sinless, but their heart was perfect and right with God. A, uh, we're, blameless does not mean you've never done nothing wrong. Blameless means your present life style shouldn't bring any reproach on the name of Christ or the church or the Bible. In other words, you should be living right. And not living in any kind of open sin that would cause people to be able to point a finger and say, well, he claimed to be a Christian. Look at that. Da, 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 da. Don't be a hypocrite. So blame, that's what blameless and harmless without rebuke. Uh, live, live so that nobody can't point their finger at you. Now, they may do it, but don't let it be justified. You ever heard that little saying, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Everybody's seen that. They put it on plaques and stuff. If you were on trial for being a Christian, could they bring up enough evidence to convict you? Uh, it'd be hard to prove it on some people. <laughs> uh, so he said, without rebuke. Look at verse 15. In the midst of a crooked and perverse. See that word perverse? Like pervert. Perverted. Nation. That's the United States of America. Uh, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We are living in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Amen or amen. Is that an amen or is that an amen? Good. Not crooked and perverse. Crooked. Crooked. Uh, when we see a, a left-wing liberal Democrat, and he's a right-wing uh, conservative Republican, and one of them preachers said, uh, just remember, the left wing and the right wing is attached to the same buzzard. <laughs> that's true. Well, that's as crooked as a dog tying leg. And uh, they, they, I mean, it's, we, we're not even get into that tonight. But, um, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. A politician stand up and tell a flat out lie, and everybody knows it's a lie, and he knows it's a lie, and they all know it's a lie. And you, the reporter asked, somebody asked the reporter about it, and they say, well, well, that's politics. That's what they say nowadays. That's politics. And I think there was a time in this country when a politician said something is supposed to be the truth, or at least his view of the truth. Now it's just like I had no dealings with China. I have no dealings with it. I do know that. And, and people say, well, he's just politics. It don't matter. Lie is a lie. And you light, the, you light the, the White House up, in the rainbow colors to honor a lifestyle that is perverse. According to the Bible, we're in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Ain't no doubt about it. Ain't no doubt about it. We're there. And here's what we're supposed to do. Verse 16. Holding forth the word of life that uh, Paul said to them, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. He said, you know what I want y'all to do? He said, I want you to hold forth that word of life. He said, I want y'all just call that thing forth and keep witnessing, and keep preaching it, and keep telling people about it, and keep winning souls with it, and everything, so that I can rejoice over you in the day of Christ. Now, we'll take a time out right here, and study just really quick that little phrase, day of Christ. And the reason I want to do this, because it will help you as we study uh, a little stronger doctrine in days to come.
the day of Christ is a term that's mentioned three times in the Bible. Two in Philippians and one in 2 Thessalonians. Many, many preachers, in, in my opinion, get it all confused. Uh, and, and I've heard it taught every way you can teach it. I've heard it taught about four different ways. But briefly, I'm going to tell you uh, my view of what the day of Christ is. I, I know some preachers that try to differentiate between uh, the day of Christ and the day of the Lord and say that the day of Christ is the rapture and that the day of the Lord would be the Lord, the judgment on, you know, after the rapture and the tribulation and the millennium day. Now, you know, in the Bible, when it says the day of the Lord, day of Christ, it ain't just talking about one 24 hour day. You know, people say, well, back in the day, when they say, when we say back in the day, we don't mean one day, one 24 hour period. We mean a day, a day and time. In the days of Noah, the days of Lot, the day, a certain period of time. Not just two days, not just three days. It can be uh, 100 years. Uh, now, the, the day of Christ cannot be the rapture if you believe in the pre tribulation rapture. Here it is. He said, I want to rejoice in the day of Christ. Look back at chapter 1. Look at chapter 1, verse 10. That ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. There it is again. Now, if them were the only two references to that scripture, I'd say, yeah, yeah, that's probably talking about the rapture. But the third one just completely blows that out of the water. Second Thessalonians. Look at Second Thessalonians chapter 2. I don't know if you, you know this or not, but 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is one of the hinges of the entire doctrine of eschatology. Eschatology means the study of future things. That's what it means. Sim that's a simple way of saying what's coming in the future. There's the pre-tribulation view, which means Jesus comes before the tribulation, takes the church home, then we have the Antichrist, tribulation, all that, and then the Lord comes the second coming, at the end of the tribulation. There is the mid-tribulation view. That means you know, they're here for three and a half years. And the Lord comes in the middle of the tribulation. And there is the post-tribulation view. A lot of people. And you say, well, what does it matter? Here's what it matters. The mark of the beast is coming. The Antichrist is coming. That's what matters. And you got to get this straight. I don't claim to know everything. But, I, I mean, I've studied this stuff a lot Got went cross eyed looking at it sometimes. And I want to show you something here. Look at uh, chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read it. I'll, we'll come back and study it sometime. But I'm just going to read it tonight. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So our gathering together under him, that would have to be the rapture when we're gathered to him. But look. Verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as at the day of Christ is at hand. So he's writing these people and he said, look, I don't want you to be scared. I don't want you to be worried, all tore up, thinking that the day of Christ is at hand. You know, that's a weird way of saying it, ain't it? If the day of Christ is the rapture, why would you be scared of it? That's something to look forward to. You think, oh my goodness, I can't wait. Bring it on. Let's have the day of Christ. But they were soon shaken, they were shaken in mind because they thought that maybe the rapture had come or they was going to go through the tribulation. Now look at verse number three. The bottom part of verse two said, the day of Christ is at hand. Don't, don't think that it's at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Now in context, that day would be what? The day of Christ. Well, if it means if it means rapture, that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Is the man of sin going to be revealed for the rapture? A lot of preachers believe that. There are a lot of preachers, Baptist preachers, that believe that the Antichrist is going to come and we'll see him then because of that verse. 
the day of Christ, or as Eric said, the rapture, if that's what the day that verse is saying. I believe it's talking about the day of Christ. Will not come until there be this big apostasy falling away and the Antichrist be revealed. So either either the day of Christ don't mean the rapture or we're going to see the Antichrist. One of them do. Now, Tim Hay and that whatever that guy's name is, made those Left Behind series books and all that. Good, really, it's a good, good novel, good story and everything. I basically, basically had it right. But you know what them guys teach? To make verse 2 be pre-trib, them guys make the falling away the rapture. Have you ever heard that? Raise your hand. Okay? That's what they do. A lot of them do that. They'll say, see, there'll be a great falling away. Well, the, well the, the Antichrist can't come until the church leaves, so the falling away is the rapture. For, I, it's beyond my imagination to describe the rapture as a falling away. We fell up in the sky. Uh, you know, it, but that's what they teach because it, it said a departure, which falling away does mean departure. And you could twist it and say falling away means departure, so when the rapture comes, we're going to depart. But I, I, they, I, you, know, you, know, you know that that's what that is is it's, it's twisting that verse just a little bit to make it teach the pre-tribulation rapture. I don't think you have to do that. You don't have to twist the verse to make it teach what you believe. If the day of Christ is from the beginning of the tribulation on, his day, first day, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. We've done had all six of those days. Each day represents a thousand years. There's one left. That's the millennium. One thousand years, Jesus on earth. His day. That's his day. Now let me show you a place. In, hold, your, hold your place there in 2 Thessalonians. We ain't through yet. Look back at Luke 17. Luke 17. Hold your finger there. I know this is kind of heavy for some of you, but try to swallow it the best you can. And uh, and we'll, we'll go on to some other stuff here in a minute. Um, uh, let's see here. Luke 17. Look at verse 24. Look, look at verse 24. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part of heaven shineth unto the other part of the heaven, that ain't the rapture. Can't be. When the Lord comes in the rapture, it don't shine from one part of heaven to the other part of heaven. So shall also the Son of Man be in what? His day. That's His day. His day. You say, well, Brother Danny, why does it say the day of Christ and not the day of the Lord? I'll give you my opinion. Can't prove this. But I think the day of Christ specifically would describe what the Lord Jesus Christ himself was doing, tribulation and millennium. And the day of the Lord would be describing the whole point like the wrath of God on the earth uh, on that all the way through. The day of the Lord is mentioned 31 times in the Bible. The day of Christ, three. Now we know that, look at verse, we're back in 2 Thessalonians now, and I can't spend all my time on this, but we've got to look at this. Verse three, let no man deceive you by any means. That day, so if it's talking about the day of Christ, bottom verse two, that's context. Day of Christ, but that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. That can't, that ain't right. That's a, it's a departure. It's an apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. That's the Antichrist. That's, that's when Judas' spirit comes out of the bottomless pit and possesses the, bottom, the body of the Antichrist. There's only two people in the Bible called the son of perdition. Judas Iscariot and the Antichrist. Same man. Not the same body. That same spirit. Look at verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worship. Now here's Daniel. Here's Daniel chapter 9. So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. You see that? Now that's why all these preachers say there's got to be a temple built. The third temple. 
You hear all these preachers, you hear all my own pre TV and all these prophecy preachers and everything, they're saying, there's going to be another temple built. There's going to be another temple built. That's why. Because the Antichrist will actually sit in the temple and claim he's God and the abomination of desolation, then everybody has to take off running for the mountain. That's what that scripture is talking about. Let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. Woe to them with child. And them it gives suck in those days. That old country preacher, that, that ain't got nothing to do with the rapture. What difference does it make if you're having a child at the rapture? You should just go on to heaven. Or pray that your flight be not in the winter. See, that can't be the rapture. The, what difference does it make if the rapture is in the wintertime? We're going to freeze on the way up? No, we're changed. We get a new body, it won't get cold. It's a different time. And I'm going to tell you something, people. The coming of the Lord is not just a one-day event. The first coming wasn't. The first coming was part one. He came in a baby a manger at night to believers only. Nobody else even knew he was here, right? Except the, the, the shepherd at night, like a thief in the night. Then you didn't hear nothing else about him until he was 12. They popped in there and showed him the doctors. Then when he was 30, he came and was baptized. And then he was crucified. All of that is the first coming. All of that together is the first coming. Not just one day one, or one night. Now, let's read on a little bit more in 2 Thessalonians. My goodness, I'm, I'm going to waste all my time. Not waste, you know. Uh, remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. So in verse 4, that's when the mark of the beast comes out. Uh, on your hand or on your forehead. That's the mark right there, buddy. That's when everything's going to get bad. Verse 6, and now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealing his time. See, you know what's stopping the Antichrist right now. There's somebody stopping the Antichrist from taking over the world right now. I've had people ask me, do you believe the Antichrist is in the world alive right now? I don't know that. Answer that. He might be. I don't know. I don't know if he will come down after the rapture or he's here right now. He might very well be here. I've heard that debated. And, and there's nothing in the Bible that said the tribulation starts immediately after the rapture. Maybe a little time frame in there. I don't, I don't know that. I've heard that debated back and forth. Maybe a while for the temple to be revealed. By the way, before I read this next verse, you know, you know they say, have you all seen that stuff on the internet? That the, the material for the third temple are in Jerusalem right now. And all they have to do is put that thing together and it can be done in just a few short months. Have anybody seen anything, seen any videos like that? Uh, they're, they're doing all kind of stuff like that. That the temple is ready to be rebuilt right now. There's only one problem. That Muslim mosque is sitting right there on that spot. Now there's some of them that believe they're going to build it in another spot. I can't see that happening. I can't see that happening. Uh, yeah, it might be something in there about... They say that it was down the road a little bit or something like that. But, um, boy, you talk about triggering World War III, brother. You blow up that Muslim mosque over in the middle of Jerusalem, and you all you know what's going to break loose. And Islam's going to be in major power during the tribulation because their, ex their method of execution is beheading. Think about that. I used to preach that a long time ago. We used to preach, tribulation will get your head cut off. You don't take the mark of the beast. And I remember thinking, ah. Uh, Nowadays, they just put people in an electric chair or in the gas chamber. And then all of a sudden, we hear that again. They're doing it. They're beheading Christians. They're beheading people. That's why they do it. And that'll be the form of execution in the tribulation. You say, well, that'll never happen here in the United States. I don't, don't get mad at me. And I'm not even sure this is right. Because people ask me all the time, where's the United States in prophecy? I don't believe the United States is mentioned in prophecy. And the reason I don't is because there may not even be no United States as we know it during that time. We're losing our country right now. Right now. I know I'm dumping a lot on y'all, but it'll give you something to think about. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll read your Bible so we can sit a, well, instead of watching golf. I mean, I don't know if anybody here watches golf. I have no idea. But you're hard up something to do, boy. <laughs> Let me see. And just sit there. Whisper. Whispering in a sport. That's weird. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, 
How did I get off on that? Oh, oh yeah, I was, uh, I was about ready to have the Holy Ghost call us out. Wasn't it? Verse 7. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, the person, who now letteth, see verse 7, that means hinder, stop, withhold, get in the way of, keep the Antichrist from coming, will hinder until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Capital W, that's Antichrist. So there's a person in the world keeping the Antichrist from coming right now, and he's going to be taken out of the way. And I, a lot of my good friends disagree. I, even some of my famous preachers disagree. Dr. Ruckman don't even, didn't even teach this right. But it's the Holy Ghost. It's got to be. Nobody else qualifies for that. Nobody else qualifies for a restraining power. And, 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 and I, I listened to Dr. Ruckman. He said, well, the Holy Ghost can't lead because he's omnipresent. And he is omnipresent. But, 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 here's where he missed it. Here's where he missed it. Jesus said, when he was praying with the disciples, you pray, and when he comes, he'll lead you and guide you into all the truth. The Holy Spirit was here then. He was here before he was here. He was omnipresent then, and then he came on the day of Pentecost. He was already here, but he came in power on the day of Pentecost. So in his restraining ministry, reprove the world of sin, rights, and judgment to come, then he'll be taken as that ministry. Obviously, he's still everywhere. But he's taken as far as his ministry of the church goes. He's taken out of the way. And he's in us. And he can't leave us nor forsake us. So bless God when he goes, we're going with him. Right. Yep. And I, I was really going to finish this chapter tonight, but it's impossible. So anyway, I just thought I'd give you something to chew on there. I don't fall out. i got good preacher friends of mine that disagree with some of what I've said here tonight. But we all believe the Lord's coming to get us out of here one day. But anyway, I, I, my, my thoughts are the day of Christ would put more of an emphasis on what Jesus himself is doing in the tribulation millennium, sitting on the throne for a thousand years. Da, 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 da. That's his day. And the day of the Lord would be more like the judgment, the wrath of God. Of God. That's, that's the best I can explain it in my ability. Yes, sir. Yeah, 31 times. That's right. That's right, 31 times. And uh, I don't think it, the day of the Lord, I don't think it's but like one or two times in the New Testament. Uh, I know it's in 1 Thessalonians 4, the day of the Lord comes to the thief of the night, and it might be in 2 Peter, but I don't think, but anyway, the day of, I mean, the day of the Lord, 31 times the Bible, the day of Christ, three in two books. But uh, anybody else want to come in or straighten me out on something? I need all the straightening out I can get. Yes, sir. Brother. <laughs> he has. I, somebody told me that says King Charles the Antichrist, and he he don't he don't look great enough to me to be. <laughs> some reason I always visit Antichrist to be a little more charismatic or something than King Charles. He's like a boringest person in the world to look at. Yeah, yeah. Well, they are. I I think people like Henry Kissinger. Remember when everybody believed Henry Kissinger was the Antichrist? Back in the 70s, everybody says the Antichrist is Henry Kissinger because his name totaled up to be 666. And all them are is types of pictures getting ready for the real thing. King Charles might be. He declared himself the king of the earth. Ain't he the one that started making a speech one day and he said something like, he, was, he let it slip and said, he has trillions at his disposal. Remember that? And everybody said, who's he talking about? And it just slipped out. He's made a speech. He said he has trillions at his disposal. So maybe that uh, King Charles might usher him in or something. I don't know, but I don't think he's Antichrist. But and he's too old too. Uh, the Antichrist probably 30 years old, 33, 30 years old. He reigns three and a half years. Just like he's a perfect counterfeit of Jesus Christ. Perfect counterfeit. 
the death, the burial, and resurrection, the whole thing. Working miracles. He's so jealous of Jesus that he wants to be worshipped just like a Lord. All right. Give you a mouthful there, didn't we? Uh, we'll take up this next week. And uh, let's just take a second. Let's bow our heads here. Everybody bow your head and have a word of prayer. While our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, search your heart right now. And uh, nobody knows everything. Nobody, I don't, I sure don't. I'm an I'm a ignorant little student of God's Word. I need all the help I can get. But I know enough of it to know things are bad. And I know enough to know things are getting worse. And there's only one way out of here. That's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you put your faith and trust in Him? Bow your head, close your eyes. Maybe right there where you sit. You just say, Lord, uh, Lord, help me during this year. Lord, I want to be a better Christian. I'm going to get on fire. I'm going to get ready. I want to get right. I want to serve you with all my heart. Have your way in our heart, Lord. I pray that you bless everybody here. Lord, as we begin this new year, may the Holy Spirit of God touch our hearts, lead us and guide us and direct us. Lord, fill us with the Holy Spirit of God. Use us for thy glory. Have your way in our hearts, Lord. Lord, put the word of God in us. We may do like the, the Paul told them people, holding forth the word of life in a dark, dark world. Whatever you do, we'll thank you and praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. 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 All right. God bless you. We're going to have a party here now. Anniversary party for Brother Randy.